Okay. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Tian Ye. I'm a MCMPA student here at Howard Kennedy School. It's my honor to moderate the US-China relations panel discussion, which is also the closing session of the China Social and Economic Symposium organized by China Society at Howard Kennedy School. So today we are very fortunate to have two top scholars in this field to analyze the trend of China-US relations and discuss the competition and cooperation between two countries in the domain of diplomacy, geopolitics, economy, technology, and climate change. Now allow me to briefly introduce our two distinguished panelists. First, Professor Anthony Sesh is a Daewoo Professor of International Affairs in Harvard and the Director of Art Center for Democratic Governance and Innovation. So Professor Sesh teaches courses on comparative political institutions, democratic governance, and the traditional economies with focus on China. Welcome, Professor Sesh. Thank you. We then have Dr. Wang Hui Yao, the founder and the president of Center for China and Globalization, CCG. Dr. Wang is also a counselor to the China State Council, a vice chairman of Association of Economic Cooperation under the Ministry of Commerce and a director of Chinese People's Institute of Foreign Affairs, as well as a vice chair of China Public Relations Association. Dr. Wang had been a senior fellow at Harvard Kennedy School. Welcome, Dr. Wang. Thank you. Okay, before we start, um, a quick announcement to the audience. Um, throughout the panel discussion, please feel free to put your questions in the webinar Q&A box. My colleagues and I are monitoring the questions and I will raise to the panelists uh, at the right time. Okay, um, now let's get started. So talking about the China-US relations, it's probably fair to say that the relationship has reached an all-time low since the two countries re-established diplomatic relations in 1979. It seems that the confrontation now outweighs the cooperation on many fronts. In 2019, uh, in a speech at the U.S. Council on Foreign Relations, FBI Director Christopher Wray labeled China as a whole of society threat, and he called on the United States to respond with a whole society approach. So, um, Professor Sech and Dr. Wang, do you think this is a sign of potential Cold War? And what are your views of the, on the development of China-U.S. diplomacy in the future? Well, I don't think um, it would be a Cold War in the sense that the United States experienced with the former Soviet Union. And I think the Biden administration uh, wants to act in a way that does see China as a strategic competitor, but actually finds ways to prevent that sliding into uh, a Cold War. The quite simple reason being, while people might talk about uh, confronting in an all-round way, uh, the two societies and economies are intertwined and embedded in very deep ways. If one looks at the financial sector, if one looks at trade, if one looks at investment, that really means uh, that an all-out uh, confrontation uh, in the sense of a Cold War is, is really impossible. And also remember, even at the height of the Cold War with the Soviet Union, uh, Washington and Moscow still found ways to cooperate in important areas where there were global challenges. And I think that is one area that we should always keep in mind as we think about this relationship, as bad as it is at the current time, that there are pending global challenges which really need cooperation between countries like China, the United States, and indeed others, uh, to resolve problems and challenges around global public goods. So yes, the relationship uh, is very confrontational at the moment, but I think uh, one has to accept the reality from Washington's point of view that China exists, it's not going away anytime soon, and that neither you know, actions in Washington are not gonna change domestic behavior in China, and neither are actions from Beijing gonna change domestic behavior in the United States. And with that as a basis, I think we have to build platforms about 
where is it legitimate uh, to have competition? What are the areas of conflict? Many of those, of course, around territorial issues. But how do you build guardrails to stop those sliding uh, into a dangerous area? And where might one look uh, for competition? Uh, thank, thanks, Alvin. Uh, I, I think that uh, absolutely, I agree with uh, what uh, Professor Satch just said, and uh, it was really not a uh, coincidence. I mean, uh, uh, that uh, Professor uh, you know, Satch actually shared uh, uh, quite a few viewers that uh, actually I had a dialogue with uh, Graham Allison, with uh, uh, Joseph and I, uh, and of course, uh, now with uh, 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 Tony, I mean, uh, three very famous Harvard professors. Uh, all of them actually uh, uh, don't think the Cold War is, is a better uh, energy for sino us relations. For example, Graham Madison said, this is impossible if you have a Cold War, we can be uh, dead all over. So, so that, that is not really uh, 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 acceptance, I mean, for the contemporary uh, internationally uh, so intertwined world, particularly between China and US. I had a, a talk with uh, Joseph and I just, just two nights ago, and he really thinks that uh, Cold War was, uh, was, uh, was, uh, was, was not the right way to use it, uh, because uh, nowadays it's different with the Soviet Union era or Cold War era, or, uh, so that we shouldn't really push for that, because it's, uh, there's so many things we are already uh, among each other. We are, we are already uh, interconnected. I mean, Graham Edison even said we are, we are, we are linked Twins, you know, <laughs> we can't live without each other. So, so I mean, now uh, 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 Tony is uh, being a, a famous Chinese professor. I, mean, I know Tony for for over many years. He has really uh, great uh, done a great contribution to the Sino-U.S. relation and exchanges, and also for the Sino-U.S. Uh, training uh, activities. Uh, he, he's the pioneer for that, uh, for the high, high level exchange tra executive trainings, of course. So he he knows well. So I I, I agree. I mean. <laughs> Uh, this is not really a, a, a bad, best way to, to describe it. Uh, there's a probably, uh, you know, I, I, I think that now that uh, uh, President Biden and the President Xi doing their two hours long telephone call uh, on the eve of Chinese New Year, both sides acknowledge that uh, they're not seeking confrontation, which is great. I, I noticed the uh, Biden speech on the 100 days, uh, which he gave just uh, recently, very recently, to the Congress that he's also now seeking confrontation. So that's great. And we really get into some kind of Olympic uh, spirit. You know, let's, let's have a healthy, peaceful uh, competition, but real, really we should uh, uh, seek more collaboration. So the Climate Summit uh, that's, that's, that just happened last week was a, was a good example that uh, President Biden, President and the 30, 40 of our leaders sit down and talk about challenges. That is the best way to go. I really think uh, this is, I'm glad that uh, Harvard professor had this kind of consensus as well. Uh, thank you. I think on that way, Yao, um, you know, I agree that uh, there should, there has to be competition. That doesn't mean there's not enough space for, for both countries to develop. You know, without going into detail, it, it's quite clear that we have different values. Uh, there's many things that Americans find objectionable about Chinese practices. And of course, there's many things in Beijing uh, that people find problematic with American behavior. And those, those things have been made very clear. I think the one thing that China has realized better than America is that that future competition is about geoeconomics rather than uh, say in the Cold War, which also included very strong military uh, components. Now, that's not to say there's the potential uh, for military challenges, but I think where China has been moving ahead and Washington has been slow to catch up on is with its uh, outbound projects with the Belt and Road, um, that it's gaining traction in the economy. And I think one of the challenges for America is that you begin to see emerging in Asia, an economic Asia, which increasingly has China at the core because of its trade and investment, where America has uh, been left somewhat behind. But you still have the remnants and the strength, in fact, of a security Asia, which still has America at the core and which still has a very strong band of alliances 
that China really doesn't uh, possess. And while the previous administration maybe let those uh, alliances wilt, I think it's clear that the Biden administration sees part of its strategy as reviving uh, those alliances. Now, my hope would be that it wouldn't just be reviving it as a military alliance, but it would also extend into better economic development and cooperation. Yeah, yeah, great. Yeah, that, that's right. That's exactly uh, uh, probably we should work on. And, and China actually are seeking uh, more economic uh, 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 collaboration with the region. For example, they, they signed uh, ASEP uh, just uh, last uh, November, and they signed, uh, and they're trying to join uh, CPTPP. Also, it's an Asian Pacific uh, trade, uh, uh, you know, future trade uh, scheme. So. So exactly, you know, ASEAN has already become a large trading partner with China. Of course, uh, geopolitically, as you said, you know, they are more uh, probably still rely a bit on in the U.S. Uh, on, on, on the balance as well. So, so I, I was really hoping that as time goes on, uh, and the Asian and, and ASEAN and uh, Asia Pacific really become a big, big market, and China can be a really a major uh, contributor to that. Maybe we can, uh, you know, stabilize the situation, and we're playing less geopolitical. Even for the Quad, maybe we could make it more economic rather than a strategic or, or military based. So, so you're absolutely right. Yeah, yeah, I, I do think that it was a major error uh, from the United States part not uh, to disengaged from the TPP uh, process uh, because it would have kept uh, the United States with a strong role in the Asia region. I mean, I can see the logic, I can see the arguments why, and it's also debatable whether a Biden administration would go back into uh, that particular agreement, uh, given that Hillary Clinton also ran against it in 2016. But as you sort of begin to suggest, it does set a challenge for many of those countries in Asia. And my sense is, you know, pre-pandemic <laughs> traveling, in the region, that most of those countries did not want to be put in a position where they had to choose between China or the United States, or at least they did not want to be pushed to choose publicly to make a choice. And um, those pressures uh, are not going away at the present time. Yeah, we did. We did. Uh, <laughs> we really did. Uh, U.S. and China work together with the pandemic. You're absolutely right. Yes. Yeah, talking about Asia, um, based on rent cooperation, one central question about the long-term strategy competition between U.S. and China is which country has more influence in the in the Pacific region. So, since President Obama proposed the PV to Asia strategy, the conflict between China and the U.S. in this region have intensified like day by day. So, uh, Professor Sech and Dr. Wang, what's the nature of these conflicts, in your opinion, is it possible for China and the U.S. to achieve their respective strategy goals in, the, in this region under kind of peaceful conditions in the future? Do you want to go first this time, Huiya? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Tony. Yeah, no, I, I think that, uh, you know, uh, uh, China is, uh, is, uh, is uh, of course, in the last uh, several decades growing uh, uh, quite rapidly, particularly economically-wise. And, uh, for example, ASEAN has already become a large trading partner. And even for India, I mean, there was a lot of uh, uh, Chinese companies doing business in India. For example, Xiaomi was in India and then become, uh, in three or four years, become the largest mobile provider for India market as well. So I, I see an enormous potential for the economic uh, cooperation. Yet, I think there's a, the China does <laughs> did uh, does suffer a, a disadvantage is that uh, China is neighboring four, 14 countries, uh, 14, 15 countries. And the U.S. basically has, has, you know, I mean, they have a, you know, geographically very friendly Canada, maybe a, a Mexico on the other side. It's not really as complicated as China. But I think China is still doing, uh, it's okay. It, it, you know, you're trying to uh, have this uh, one plus uh, 10, you know, one plus, uh, you know, 10, 10 plus three. So China is a, uh, uh, is seeking uh, with ASEAN, uh, 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 you know, with this free trade, but also is talking with uh, 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 Japan and Korea for the for the you know for the free trade as well, FTA, and of course India was uh, I think uh, probably before the pandemic, uh, China, India, and a few years back 
still relatively good. Moody was visiting China and the person she visited in New Delhi. I think, you know, what has happened in the last few years is driven quite a bit by this uh, uh, negative sentiment, I think really uh, dominated by the U.S., where I think they've been really depicting China as, uh, as uh, uh, quite uh, uh, negatively. Of course, China probably also responds sometimes very strongly to that as well. So, so, so there's, there's caused some concern, I think, on neighboring countries. But I think in the long run, China is always a peaceful country. China never, never colonized any, any place, uh, uh, you know, the, in, 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 in the hundred years before Columbus de developed, de discovered American uh, Zheng He has led uh, six times, seven times expedition as far as to African or, or you know, South Asia, China never stayed there. So in Chinese philosophy and culture-wise uh, heritage, China is always a peaceful, neutral, uh, middle ground kind of a country. So, so, so I think in the future, uh, you know, this probably can continue. I, I do think that uh, if uh, U.S. make a, a, qua, a, a kind of a strategic alliance against China or even call it a NATO of, 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 of uh, Indo-Pacific, that probably is really uh, trying to make a, a you know self-fulfilling prophecy to, to drive China to defend that. So probably we should be more uh, rational uh, on those approaches. I think on 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 the whole, I mean, uh, China is also seeking to uh, working with all the other countries in neighboring China in, in a good uh, position and uh, solve things among themselves without foreign interference. Probably. Yeah, I think Obama's was more of a pirouette rather than a pivot. It didn't really sort of fully uh, turn to uh, to Asia. Um, I think, though, to to sort of understand Washington's perspectives, I agree with with uh, Hui Yao that you know China has not you know taken other areas, uh, other countries over militarily. It hasn't had that kind of colonial expansionism. But certainly from Washington, and I think it's important to understand this, one can disagree or agree, they have seen more aggressive approaches from China, particularly over the last eight or nine years. And I think from Washington's perspective, what really began to solidify this shift in view was back in 2012, was when uh, China decided to occupy the Scarborough Shoals, which of course is also claimed by the Philippines and conducted the build up there. And even though China had signed on to the law of the seas, it rejected those findings. And I think that gave an impression in Washington that uh, China was beginning to engage in more aggressive actions in the maritime areas. I think it also created uh, concerns among some of the Southeast Asian nations about China's intentions. So, um, while I agree with much of what Hui Yao said, I think if you look at it from Washington perspective, it looks a little different. And then, of course, we know there's very significant differences about uh, Beijing's actions in recent years in Hong Kong. Are they abiding by agreements that were made back in the 90s? Um, and, of course, uh, what is seen as more intimidating behavior uh, towards Taiwan. So, again, it depends where you sit the way you see these things. And I think from the US, uh, it gives a different picture. And one can understand, you know, what is called the wolf warrior diplomacy, uh, the more aggressive defense of Chinese actions. It doesn't play well globally uh, for the most part. And I think if you look at a lot of opinion polls in different countries, again, uh, that has created concern and uh, in some cases declining popularity. And I think it's something that China is going to have to adjust to over time, that China now is a global power and it has to behave like a global power. And so, you know, behavior that appears could be taken to be seen as threatening will not go down too well. You're falling back on the hundred years of humiliation. Yes, that's true. But is that what you want to hear from a major global power moving forward? So I do think both capitals uh, need to adjust their rhetoric and behavior. Yeah, I, I think so. That uh, uh, the uh, one of the disadvantages China has is that you know ninety percent of the 
international major media outlets are, are in English, uh, which influential. Uh, uh, and also, so uh, America also quite dominant on those uh, narratives. And uh, so China is still uh, has, a, has a, a long catching up to do in terms of trying to explain itself better. And of course, also to, uh, to uh, let people to see uh, what, what, what will come out eventually. I mean, uh, you know, China, uh, if even for the neighboring uh, of China, China hasn't really uh, caused any major conflict uh, for, for, for recent history. So, so, so I think that, uh, you know, people may speculate. And, uh, but, uh, but, but the, the problem, problem is that the uh, U.S. has been sending their uh, aircraft and, uh, you know, fleet uh, uh, frequently to the South China Sea and the Taiwan Strait. Uh, very very often, so 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 that that is really where I think China also felt has been uh, threatened as well. China hasn't sent any people uh, to Caribbean or, or, or military exercise in those regions. So so I, I do agree. You know, both 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 country and both capital needs a lot of dialogue, need a lot of communication, and and better uh, you know sorted out their their, their misunderstanding, and then really uh, you know look let let people in the region to to, to sort them out as well. Yeah. Yeah, and again, I think it depends where you sit, the way you see it. And obviously, Washington interprets those things differently. But if I was sitting in Beijing, if I looked out and looked around, I would think, yeah, this gets pretty close to containment uh, in terms of alliances that are being built around me. But just one comment on the media. It, it, it's true, yes, of course, much is English. I think one of the things that uh, the propaganda authorities in, in, in Beijing need to kind of get to grips with is the kind of language and the kinds of approaches which might go do down well in China don't go down so well in the English-speaking communities. And that appears as more of a kind of threatening language which turns people off. Now, it may play well to domestic nationalist sentiment. I don't think it plays very well uh, internationally. Yeah, these days, I mean, even the domestic uh, uh, message is international message, international message is domestic message. I, I think that, uh, you know, there is, we, we need a new narrative, absolutely, I, I think. But on the other hand, it, it is also true the, uh, the West media sometimes, they, they, they have a you know, long ideological hands on China. So, so, so it's, it's not a short term. Uh, I, I, I think we can uh, hope improve on that. And, uh, but I, I, you know, uh, Tony, I, I read your recent, uh, you know, last year, probably in July, uh, 2020, uh, there's a great uh, uh, paper, you, you report you published, uh, uh, Understanding CCP Resilience, Surveying Chinese Public Opinions Through Time, you know, which you have uh, constantly monitored China uh, through 2003. And uh, uh, that, that's something I thought also caused the ideological uh, Differences because China is always at a high authority somewhere for five thousand years, always a highly centralized uh, country and uh, authority. You know, you know those big irrigation projects, those big uh, country uh, geographically needs a strong authority. And now, you know, let alone governing uh, one point four billion people, the largest in the world. So, so the CBC now, I mean, they lifted eight hundred million people out of poverty. They've been doing all the infrastructure transformation in China. And, and also anti-corruption and all the things. So, so I think that your, your, your survey has really uh, quite well documented all those uh, changes and, and also the, the, the general masses uh, acceptance of CPC, you know, they, they, they deliver through their legitimacy, uh, the earlier legitimacy by really constant uh, responding to the, to the economic needs, which is great. So, so maybe, uh, you know, I, I think there's a little bit is that how we can really have a better message, have a better understanding of the world, uh, rather than uh, you know this uh, this kind of as you said the wolf worry uh, behavior going on <laughs> in, in both places probably. Yeah, yeah. I think on the, there's a couple of things that yeah, I think is worth saying with that. One mm -hmm. thing our surveys found, which unfortunately we're not allowed to conduct anymore, uh, is that. Um, Contrary to what many people outside of China have thought, the, the groups that, uh, whose satisfaction has increased most were the poorer rural and the poorer urban communities, and those communities in the hinterland of China rather than the eastern 
area of China. Now, that's not to say that satisfaction didn't increase, say, in the East or, or with richer populations. But what it says to me is that the leadership in Beijing have understood that they have had a pro they have a problem with those who have not benefited so well from reform in the past, and that really since uh, Hu Jintao and Jiabao, the investments in uh, social infrastructure have actually been popular with many Chinese citizens, whether it's uh, the restoration of the medical insurance scheme, whether it's the expansion of Dibao or other activities, but that does seem to have enhanced satisfaction. So in a way that kind of dismisses uh, one of the ideas, I think, that has been around that maybe there's a social volcano of discontent uh, related uh, to developments in China. But I do think, um, as I said earlier, really Beijing's behavior is going to be decided by what happens in, in China. And I don't think anyone can doubt that the economic growth has been spectacular. People coming out of poverty has been extraordinary. I think we can argue what really led to that. Was it state activity? Was it simply letting uh, Chinese entrepreneurial habits uh, come to the fore? But the real challenges are, you know, can China get to the next step of its development? I mean, it's been extraordinary. I, you know, one can be critical about a whole range of things, and, and people are, and I am as well. But you also have to acknowledge that some of that progress has been extraordinary and unexpected. But the real challenge is now that lie ahead of getting from being sort of upper middle income to a real uh, high income country, I think are quite considerable. And uh, some of the institutions which have served China well in the past may not be so effective moving forward. And I think this, again, is something that's ignored in Washington, where it tends to be, if you like, a straight line projection. You know, China's developed in this way, it'll keep developing. How do we deal with that? And what might the threat be coming from that? Personally, I think China is going to be much more absorbed over the next five to 10 years with dealing with these domestic challenges, which is also going to limit its capacity to extend uh, its power externally. And some people have already raised the question of, you know, is China in a phase of overreach? Has it tried too much too quickly uh, globally? I actually have some sympathy uh, for that view. Mm, yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Tony. Uh, well, I, I really uh, admire you. I mean, you've been conducting this uh, uh, survey and uh, research, I mean, since 2003, and you've been, uh, you know, go to all those uh, different areas of China. Uh, one of the, you know, one of the very uh, in-depth uh, field studies uh, with other professors too. I mean, very, very impressive. I, I do think though that uh, you've been, because you frequently with China, you, 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 you were in charge of uh, Harvard, uh, uh, China uh, executive training program. I mean, so, uh, you know, if, these days, if people come to China, they realize, I mean, it's incredible. Now, uh, even even people living in China has been surprised. But like now, China has a, a, a 1.3 billion people covered with basic Medicare and 1 billion people with some basic social uh, security uh, package as well. And of course, uh, nine, uh, you know, one to nine year compulsory education, one billion uh, smartphone users. And so I think the livelihood of the people has really has gone up enormously. And uh, so that only attributes to, uh, to the government uh, efforts, of course, with the market reform. So I would always say China is a hybrid, you know, with 67% uh, of private enterprise. And then you have another uh, term 15 multinational, another term 15 uh, SOE. That probably provide a, a right balance to, to push the economy. And also with a bigger government coordination with one five years plan after another five years plan. And now I see what President Biden is doing. Basically it's like a, you know, a little bit bigger government now, more intervention, more coordination. So, so you're right. I think you, you, you observe this phenomenon in China. And uh, I think that's where probably, uh, uh, you know, there, there are certain uh, people in the West may be lacking of that. So, so I really hope there'll be more uh, professors, academics like you to, to, to conduct a, more these kind of a, uh, types of research in China, which I think also China can learn a lot of as well. I mean, 
Uh, of course, China still have a lot of challenges. Uh, you know, uh, uh, I agree with you. You know, there's a, there's a uh, how can we sustain this kind of growth? And also, perhaps we should just play to the climate change objective. But China is sixty uh, percent rely on the coal uh, coal burning and how we can reach carbon uh, neutral uh, by twenty sixty. It's a huge challenge. China has a lot of uh, uh, and also the population is declining as well, aging. Uh, the variety of challenges facing. So. Uh, it's not a linear curve, <laughs> maybe, but we, we really have to find a way to do that. There could be synergy, though. There's, a, you know, with such an advanced uh, synergy of the high, you know, anywhere it goes a few hours by a speed train, and everybody has a, has a smartphone, like a small ERP running the, uh, its own uh, work. Uh, efficiency has greatly improved in communication costs almost zero. So, so I would say that uh, if we, we have a stable international environment, what was other well? And we don't jeopardize that. And China probably is still going to keep largely uh, with its, uh, 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 you know, uh, synergy to, to, to grow uh, for the next uh, uh, five years plan. And also the next 35, uh, uh, China 2035 for the midterm range as well. No, I mean, uh, collaborative research, I think, is important for enhancing understanding and also progress. I mean, Harvard has had for, I don't know, 25, 30 years, very good collaboration precisely around questions of air pollution, climate, uh, and so forth, which has you know, progressed uh, significantly over that period of time with colleagues through, through Tsinghua. And I do hope that those kinds of collaborations are, are able to continue. Uh, it's getting much more difficult, to be honest, though, in the areas that I work in, if you're trying to do field research or in the social sciences, uh, it's much more difficult to do research in China uh, than it was a few years ago. And that, I can see why perhaps Chinese authorities don't want foreigners kind of mucking around in those areas. But it also entails a backlash. I mean, it also entails uh, less, if you like, hospitable, less favorable views of China amongst academics uh, because of that process. It also occurred to me, <clears throat> another thing as you were talking, Wei Yao, <clears throat> you know, our politicians tend to go to Beijing, Shanghai, Shenzhen, for example, Guangzhou, maybe. If I only went to those cities, I would come back terrified about China's development. I mean, it's just staggering. But if I started going to rural Guangxi, I started going to rural Yunnan, I started maybe going to some of the mountains in Sichuan. I'd come back with a different perspective, I think, of China. Going back to what I talked about earlier, that China's domestic challenges are complex and are going to entail considerable attention from the Chinese leadership. And it's not that the whole of China is now full of glittering uh, skyscrapers uh, like uh, Shanghai or Shenzhen. And I think it would help foreigners get a more sophisticated and perhaps more all-round perspective of what China has done and the challenges that still face China moving forward. Yeah, I agree. I, I think that uh, absolutely we need the more uh, international uh, uh, academic exchanges. Uh, we need the more international study exchanges. And we need a more, uh, uh, you know, a veteran uh, China hand like you to 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 conduct a more uh, or guide more studies in China. I mean, I, I was also quite uh, disappointed with the recent, uh, you know, particularly last few years that the, the, it seems there's a there's a you know a phrase of the of the exchanges on the academics and also uh, you know the number of uh, uh, American students in China is, is dropping uh, mm. and also the tourism uh, to China is dropping too i mean come, even up to the level of the Beijing Olympic uh, in t- 12 years ago so so i really hope that with uh, with uh, china infrastructure and all the accommodation hotels and uh, uh, all the things that we should really make it more friendly for for our international visitors and also uh, international academic student exchanges absolutely i mean Anybody who come to China and see China in a different China and uh, uh, complete China, they will have a better view on China <clears throat> rather than they are not coming. So, so it's so important that we maintain this dialogue and maintain this open openness. And uh, I hope that uh, uh, you know, in, in, in the university program, we, we should keep it open. We should keep the visa also uh, a ten-year multiple entry visa for both countries. 
and we should let the people come uh, back and free. So how we can really get this pandemic uh, freezing situation relaxed soon would be great. I'm glad to hear that uh, by August 1st, uh, U.S. University is now starting to accept uh, international students to come in. And I hope the same thing will be happening to China as well. I really hope so. Yeah, st still on the diplomacy relationship between the two countries, we noticed that um, a very interesting um, change might happen. It has been reported by uh, Wall Street Journal that um, Professor Burns uh, at Harvard Kennedy School might be appointed as the new U.S. ambassador to China. Uh, ambassador Burns uh, is well known for being a tough negotiator um, and also a strong advocate for uh, of China's oppression by actively calling for alliance with countries like Japan, Australia, European Union, you can, you can name those countries. So he would be very different from the previous ambassadors to China in terms of like background and expertise. Uh, so the question is, if um, Professor Burns is officially appointed, what kind of impact will it have on the diplomatic relations of the two countries? Yeah, of course, I have no idea whether he will be appointed, so I can't speak from that perspective. I think one of the things you, you have to remember about uh, Nick is that he is a long-term career diplomat. Um, you know, when he came to the Kennedy School, I think he was the highest uh, ranking person within the State Department who was not a political employee. Um, so that means he's well gifted in the craft of diplomacy. Um, he knows how to approach, he knows how to argue. When you're an ambassador, though, you're not going to behave differently than your government is telling you to behave. Now, you might try and sort of get more realistic messages back to that government. So, you know, so Nick Burns is not going to behave in a way which is out of step with the Biden administration. I do know though, Nick um, has a strong experience of working with China on certain issues around Iran and also on uh, the question of the Korean Peninsula in the six party talks. And he's often commented uh, in those six party talks that China actually played a very constructive role. So I don't think it shuts out uh, the possibility uh, for kind of creative dialogues. Um, but, you know, he knows the diplomatic scene well. He knows many of those other countries in Asia, uh, as well as China. I'm sure he's going to draw on those connections to promote uh, what the Biden administration sees as being in the best interests of the United States. So I wouldn't see that him being appointed as ambassador, should he be so, uh, will lead to any significant difference from where the Biden administration has taken its approach, which we talked about earlier. Yeah, I, I do see uh, President Biden actually appoint a lot of more uh, competent and professional uh, seasoned uh, staff. I mean, uh, also, he's, uh, he's uh, really uh, emphasized a lot of balance, a lot of uh, gender uh, uh, quality, and, uh, and also he's speaking experienced uh, 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 you know, diplomats or uh, uh, ex-officials. Uh, but, but come to the Nick cases, I, I, Nick Burns, okay, so I think that uh, if he has worked in the government, worked in Harvard, is the top uh, university in the world and has a long tradition of those so, uh, exchanges with China, has many Chinese students, scholars there. So he probably is, is, uh, is aware, aware of all those issues and the challenges, the opportunities. Uh, well, let's hope that uh, uh, this is not a rumor, but, uh, but definitely uh, I'm sure we need a strong, uh, capable uh, U.S. ambassador to really uh, protect some uh, uh, right uh, channels and the bridges and, uh, and the communication uh, back to the U.S. Uh, and, and then we hope that, uh, uh, you know, sign of U.S. relation can be stabilized. Yeah, I think what Kuei said at the end there is the most important. What you want from your ambassador is someone who can pick up the phone and talk to the president if there is an important issue or if there's information to be fed back. 
Now, I don't know whether Mr. Burns has that capability, but I do know he has worked closely with uh, President Biden's um, foreign um, think tanks and group thinking about foreign policy. So he clearly has a deep connectivity to those who are now working in the administration uh, on East Asian affairs, for example. But as I said at the beginning, I have zero idea about whether he will or will not be appointed. But I just want to reemphasize the point I made that whoever gets there, you want someone who can pick up the phone and talk to the president directly. Yeah, thank you, Paul. Yeah, as a student in Professor Burns class, I do respect him and his expertise. I, I wish him great success if got appointed. And I really hope he can bring his diplomatic wisdom to China and restore the US-China relationship. Um, now let's move to the economic side. Um, the China-US trade war that began in 2018 has already caused tremendous damage to both countries. So the question is, like under the Biden administration, will the economic decoupling between the two countries be eased or it will be the opposite? Like there will be even more fierce conflicts over the economic issues like tariffs, exchange rate, debate, and also the like the argument around the state-owned enterprise, IP issue, you, you can have a long list of those issues. So, so like uh, Professor Sesh and Dr. Wang, what, what's your view on that? I mean, first on the trade war, it's clear in statements that have been made that they're not going to lift yet uh, the tariffs, which was imposed by the Trump administration. Personally, I find that a little bizarre because uh, there is no real evidence that shows they've been beneficial to the US economy and perhaps have been even detrimental to the US economy. So why do you want to keep in place a policy which is actually detrimental to your own country? I don't really understand that. I do understand it in a political sense that the Biden administration does not want to be seen as being weak and they would be attacked, I think, if they list, lifted uh, those uh, tariffs. There's a, there's two very important points about the trade, though. Um, the first is um, the idea that it's somehow a zero-sum game is, of course, a nonsense. Um, and secondly, related to that, if you look at the trade deficit, it doesn't reflect the true situation of the economic interaction between the countries. Uh, many, many years ago, Larry Lau, the economist, uh, calculated what he called the value added into trade. And if you calculate that in, the trade deficit drops by between a third and a half. Now, let me give you one example. Um, uh, producing Apple iPhone, something like that. 3.4% of that value stays with China, yet it sells at $240. So $240 gets booked in the trade figures, but that's not real. I mean, that's not a reality of what uh, China is actually taking uh, from that. It also ignores the fact that US companies sell over $200 billion worth of goods in China. So this is a much more complex uh, picture than it's been painted. And uh, someone really needs to get a hold and grip of this. And trade, um, China has been more dependent on exports to America than the other way around, although US exports have increased significantly. There's a couple of areas for the US consumer which could be problematic. 80, 90% of laptops in America come from China, similar with iPhones. So it needs to be looked at really carefully. The bigger question of decoupling, again, goes back to some of the points that Hui Yao and I have raised before. There's such an interlinkage that complete decoupling is impossible, which is not to say that it won't increase in certain areas. Also remember, it wasn't President Trump that necessarily started decoupling. You know, China banned Facebook, it banned Google, it banned uh, Twitter, for example. Um, that's a pretty clear example of decoupling. So, you know, there's faults there on both sides. And I think it depends where you look. I think trade will decrease. And I think China is looking for other markets. Um, 
So it's not so over-dependent, not necessarily just on the US, but also on the European Union. But if we take the financial sector, for example, that's $5 trillion worth of business. And China really needs access to global financial markets. So it's very heavily in China's interest to stay engaged in that sphere. And I think Beijing has been quite clever in um, indicating to Wall Street that it's going to be willing to make it easier for financial institutions to operate in China, possibly driving a wedge between Wall Street and Washington. So financial decoupling is much more difficult uh, to imagine. FDI, I think from both sides, is again probably going to decline. Um, you know, most Chinese investment FDI into the US today has not really been strategic. It's been one-off, it's been trophy projects, which is very different from US investment into China, which is a part of their global production and supply chains, a much more strategic aspect. But I think because of things around the unlevel playing field that may, uh, in the US business community sense, uh, China's own policies made in China 2025 is probably going to reduce uh, those levels. And similarly, Washington's actions to restrict uh, Chinese investment and collaborations in certain areas is also uh, going to put up barriers to Chinese investment. So it's not going to decouple completely, um, uh, but I think in certain areas we will see shifts. But like a lot of what we've talked about in this uh, discussion today, yes, competition in some areas but some areas it's just mutually beneficial and that will continue. Yeah, I, I agree with uh, what uh, Tony just said. I, I think that uh, the couple is not really uh, the, op, you know, uh, the, the option. Uh, well, I, I think that uh, yeah, we're really living in the 21st century. I mean, since the but there's about 50,000 US companies set up uh, operations in China, generated $700 billion revenues, as, as Tony rightly said. You know, they're, Apple made in China, you know, China made uh, 50 bucks, bucks a bit, and several other bucks in, in, in the international market. It's a, it's, a, it's a global value chain. China has played a platform role, uh, maybe making, but then the design, the all the value added, all the chips. So, the, so, so this actually decoupling. I mean, we, we're causing the international shortage of the chips now because everybody is worried about future uh, tech war. And uh, now the, a lot of auto, auto, auto makers is uh, is. Uh, uh, stop the manufacturing because they don't have the chips uh, anymore. That's really absurd. And but also it's going to uh, really uh, damage hugely the U.S. business. I mean, uh, you know, after all, I mean, look at the GM, Ford, or, or even all those European automakers sells more cars in China than they, than their own countries. I mean, Apple, uh, China's Apple's second largest market as well. So I I, I do think that. Uh, this kind of a decoupling cannot really sustain. And now China has continued to open up. China set up a 20, 20, 21 free trade zone and the Highland being the largest financial sector, China has been completely opened up. And also uh, the, the President Biden still talk about China's, uh, you, know, uh, you know, technology, uh, IPR protection and things like that. But China now uh, applies more patents than the U.S. company now, and the largest com com patent compl complication comes from China. Chinese company have the same desire, not even less uh, than the international and U.S. companies. So, so, so I think things can be really addressed. And China wants to jump uh, TPP, CPTPP now, which is designed by the U.S. for a higher standard IPR and uh, intellectual property and, and also uh, SOE reform and environment standards, and also, of course, data flow and the labor rights, uh, what have you. So, so you see, uh, China is not afraid of changes, and China wants to do that, and WTO reform too. So I really hope that we come back to this kind of flat platform and talk and, and, and negotiate and then set up the good examples for the rest of the world, because I think the, the trade uh, has, has really uh, benefited uh, all countries. Uh, as, uh, as Tony also said, I mean, the... the the trade, I, I read one of your articles, that trade has, uh, uh, from U.S. to China, since Ch China joined WTO, has gone up 500 times, 500%, 500%, that's, that's five times. So, so China has actually, GDP has gone up 10 times uh, since China jumped. It's, it's, it's good for both countries and for the world. So, so I really hope that uh, 
we will follow uh, you know those uh, economic uh, uh, rationality and then you know let's let's move from uh, you know get a, get aside those uh, geopolitical which I think are the damage both countries in the long run. Yeah, I think uh, you know one of my colleagues, Bill Overholt, I think has made a very valid point. You know, the from from our perspective from the U.S., there's many things we can be critical of of China's behavior, but we should be critical of the right things, not the wrong things. And I think what is happening at the moment is everything's getting piled in as if everything is wrong. As you correctly said, Hui Yao, and again, this is a point Bill Overholt made. Um, China saved GM. You know, G- Ch- GM might have well gone under without the China market. Um, but it, there is an underlying issue where I think people in Washington and now the business community feel China, it may be making process, progress, but is not moving quickly enough. In some ways, yes, China is more open than our allies like Japan and South Korea in terms of uh, business practices and engagement. But the real significant difference is, you know, China is not the economy of 2000 when it joined WTO. And I think in those days, one could let a lot of practices and a lot of things slide. And now when you fast forward to 2021, where China is such a huge economy, uh, you know, can it really still operate under the principles in which it joined WTO, which gives it some elements of developing country status, some elements of developed country status. And I think if progress can be made in those areas, that would smooth the relationship enormously. Because otherwise we're gonna continually get these criticisms. Oh, there's not a level playing field. You know, foreign business is not well treated. Uh, Too much uh, stealing of property rights uh, and intellectual property, so on and so forth. And that's something I think both uh, capitals really need to work on. Yeah, one thing has a close tie to the economic conflict is the technology competition between the two countries. Especially in recent years, the U.S. has strengthened its blockade against the rise of China's technology, uh, like from partnership between the, the companies to academia or cooperation uh, between universities. So. Uh, Dr. Wan, Professor Sedge, the question is, are there a better way to kind of alleviate the U.S. concern about the rise of China's technology power? Or do you think this kind of blockage and suppression will be continued? Uh, which even include the like the prohibition of Chinese students from going to the United States to study, like in STEM uh, degrees? Well, I think that uh, uh, I, I hope, really hope that uh, the rational will, will come back somewhere. I mean, I, I already see probably Biden has done some of that. For example, Biden has, uh, you know, really uh, invited the uh, president to this uh, climate summit. Uh, uh, Secretary, former Secretary John Kerry has visited Ch- China. Uh, you know, the senior official has met already in the last hundred days, twice already. Uh, and also that, uh, you know, China is... Uh, is really uh, uh, working uh, uh, towards, you know, still very uh, positively to uh, uh, help, uh, uh, you know, facilitate the dialogue. And uh, what I what I think that now is that uh, there's no, you know, we should really keep the uh, 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 academic and student exchanges. That's very vital. But it's also to the American interest. Look, I mean, there's a there's a you know. Uh, a, all, 80% of the PhD in science in STEM, in the science technology field, has remained in the U.S. That's made a contribution. You mean if you go to Silicon Valley, uh, all those uh, IT companies, I mean, 20, 30% are Asians. A large chunk of that is from uh, China. And so so I think it's to, 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 to both U.S. and China uh, uh, interest if we strengthen these academic exchanges. And uh, tech, tech decouple is, uh, is, uh, is not really a possibility because... Uh, I mean, China has already experienced all those uh, uh, restrictions in, 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 in the old days, for example, in the 60s, uh, when Soviet Union withdrew everything uh, they had in China. China then managed to on its own satellite and, and all those uh, technology development. So, so I think that it may slow down China a few years, but China probably could come up because it's the largest application market. And also there's other competition, you use and other countries that come in. So, so I really think that uh, in the long run, we really need to uh, work together. It's for the American interest. Otherwise, uh, 
uh, American will suffer. I do notice that the U.S. now is trying to correct the, the, some of the problems. For example, one percent of the Wall Street is almost equal to 42, 43 percent of the mass population wealth in the U.S. And President Biden is is, uh, is trying to uh, tax on the on the you know on those riches. So that to address the domestic issue, rather than using China as a scapegoat, I mean. Uh, as also uh, Tony has rightly said, you know, technology may have uh, uh, still some of the jobs, not China still all the jobs. So, so we, we really need to uh, uh, have a right uh, perspective for that. I'm sure there will be competition, but let's have a peaceful competition. But then cooperation is really the key of the, of the message. Yeah, I think there need to be clear protocols agreed uh, between the two countries on the technological space and also in the research sphere. But I do want to stress one thing again, uh, you know, China did start by blocking companies like Facebook, Twitter, Google. I mean, that is stopping uh, access of technology companies to a major market. So this didn't necessarily, this is not just necessarily Washington's actions, even though they've been more prevalent more recently. You know, on the question of STEM and STEM research, I, I'm not a specialist in that area, so I I can't really speak clearly, but I think from Washington's perspective, um, what you really need is good national security um, advice. I have no idea what is, you know, potentially dangerous research from a national interest perspective. And I'm sure the same applies in Beijing. Um, and I think the authorities on both sides need to be clear about where a national interest might be infringed by allowing not just Chinese students, but students from other countries to engage in research in those areas. And the university should be guided by that. Beyond that, I agree 100% with Hui Yao that the more collaboration, uh, the better. Um, at the Ash Center, we have you know, up to about 30 fellows from China every year. Um, We've always found it incredibly beneficial, uh, particularly when young PhD students have come for a year um, uh, to work on public policy issues, public administration issues. Uh, I've always seen that as immense value. So I think in the current atmosphere, it's not surprising there is caution, but we don't want that caution to tip over to paranoia. And we want to try and ensure that um, the kinds of exchanges, as Hui Yao says, are beneficial on both sides. But I'm sure both sides have national security concerns, which is going to restrict interactions in certain areas. And that is quite appropriate. Uh, it it's, uh, applies to all countries, really. Yeah, yeah. I think that the best way to, to really build up the trust is through the academic, student, tourism, and the cultural exchanges. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> And, 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 and Tony, you have played a lot of role in, in Bridge the Gap. It's really, uh, we need to strengthen that. I, I, I think you're right, probably, you know, maybe we should, uh, uh, you know, let, let Google, Facebook, Twitter uh, comes in, and, uh, but also uh, U.S. maybe relax on Huawei or, or, or ZT or Alibaba or, or something. But, you know, that'd be, that'd be really great if we can see that happen. Yeah. Yeah. Look, one promising area of collaboration between the two countries lies in climate change. Um, like uh, bo both of you mentioned that uh, the climate env envoy, John Kerry, visited China earlier this month, and he's the first official representative from Biden administration to visit China. Um, he has already conveyed the intention to cooperate on climate change issues. So. However, many scholars are still worried that the potential cooperation would be affected by the overall Sino-US conflicts. Um, just caution your time, we, we, we don't have uh, enough time, but can you like quickly comment on, on this one? Like what's your views on the, on the climate change cooperation? Yeah, I mean, it always has been one of the obvious areas for potential collaboration. It falls into what I talk about as being a collaboration on new public goods, where the existing norms and institutions are not settled. And I think those are areas where China and the US and other countries can collaborate, areas of global commons like climate change, global engagement with natural disasters, global regulation for some of these tech and other areas we've talked about. And I thought it was very interesting, I know we're short of time, 
that what uh, Kerry said was he felt this was so important that it should be divorced from other contentious areas such as views on Hong Kong, Xinjiang, Taiwan, and trying to mark out uh, a terrain for collaboration. Whether that's politically acceptable in Washington, I think we're going to have to watch and see. Absolutely. I, I think uh, he's doing the right thing. I, I'm, I'm quite impressed with uh, the former Secretary John Kerry. I mean, the special envoy now for President Biden. I met him last uh, February, uh, actually last year, February, in the Munich Security Conference. He came to a CCG roundtable and he was giving a great speech then. Uh, he talked about yeah the same idea as, as Tony mentioned. I, I really I really think that uh, uh, given the current very uh, negative sentiment, I mean uh, you know President Biden has done something like uh, having a two hour long phone call with President Xi at the eve of Chinese New Year. He stopped also using the uh, uh, ethnic or, or uh, nationality language to refer uh, uh, COVID nineteen virus. Basically, stop uh, uh, banning using the China virus. Uh, uh, so he's, he's done quite a, a few things, but also uh, he's also emphasized the alliance of that. But I, I would say the alliance also have a lot of collaboration with China. So so we need really uh, China, U.S. need some time to, to build up the trust, so even from the small areas. Let's do this uh, through a climate change. It would be a great area being the two largest economies. The next area would be uh, pandemic, you know, that uh, uh, fighting, if we can work together on what happened in India, you know, really, it's an international crisis that we, both U.S. and China public can work together on that. And rather than putting a, a quad against China, we should really work on helping solving humanitarian crisis. And finally, infrastructure. Biden proposed $2.3 trillion for the U.S. infrastructure. And China is the public now has the old uh, investment technology for the infrastructure. And then two countries can work together. So I think it's important to have the trust. That is really uh, the most important thing. And then have the climate change if we build some trust. That'd be really great. Uh, my, my staff was just telling me we had almost 1 million uh, viewers online and uh, for our dialogue. This is really great. I mean, we need this kind of dialogue. I uh, really, really enjoy it. Yeah, thank you. Indeed, the climate issue is something so important that the two countries must find ways to work together, like for our planet and also for our future generations. Um, this panel discussion is coming to an end. Um, like, allow me to kind of uh, express our sincere appreciation on behalf of China Society at Kennedy School to Professor Sash and Dr. Wang for bringing us a very profound conversation on this very complex issue. Thank you both. And thank you for the invitation. And great to see you again, Huiyao. Thank you, thank you, Tony. Thank you, Alan. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and thank to you, our Alan. audience, thank you for joining us today. All the best and have a lovely weekend. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.